I think going back to the primary, you, you, told, uh, you know, the scaffolding, uh, have a sort of possibly a, a jaundiced view of it in sort of recent experience. As, uh, I think I actually, I think I actually completed my language degree here as a min, as a min, as a mature student in, in two thousand and ten. Uh, and I went off immediately thinking, oh great, you know, I've got this idealistic thing and go and help with sort of teaching and went straight off to do a PGCE. Uh, and I didn't last very long in my first, uh, uh, my first uh, uh, placement. I've been there a few weeks and, you know, you know what you said today has, you know, just confirmed that. But, <laughs> but at the beginning of, uh, before we actually started on the PGCE, with, with to go into a primary school for two weeks and just experience, uh, you know, the, thing, the various things at the primary school uh, at that, and at the school I was in were sort of, I think were teaching French, uh, and I joined sort of some of those sort of classes. <coughs> Whereas in sort of secondary schools, you'll have uh, dedicated and trained language teachers. In the primary school, uh, you don't. Now in the school I, I was in. Uh, happened to have uh, a native French teacher, but she was actually an infant teacher, uh, and when she was sort of trying to teach years five and six, she was actually sort of struggling because she wasn't used to teaching that age group, so that, that, that was a little difficult day. And then when I went uh, into the year four class, they had, uh, they had another teacher who'd obviously done her, her all level in French, even before I did, uh, and her, I think her French accent was, you know, was awful. Uh, and trying to do this, so it's just whether the, you know, the basics anyway. Even though some of the activities kind of could have been fun, but the, you, you know, the underlying sort of thing wasn't right. Now maybe that's a, you know, very bad example, but yeah. that's. The pers this perspective on this is yeah. exactly right, was that the government decided they were going to, going to introduce primary languages, which, th which they did. So for a primary teacher who already teaches 12 subjects, to teach another a 13th or a 14th or a 15th subject was a complete, was a complete shock to the system. And what happened was that some secondary schools then decided to support the primary schools by sending in specialists, which is something that I did, which took the heat off the situation. And the idea was to work with the, the primary teachers to support them and to improve the quality. So again, one of the issues that we're talking about is the quality of, what, of, of, of the language and the experience that the students are having at primary level. Um, and some of the primary teachers God help them. They they said right. Let's just put a DVD on, and that's teaching. That's that's going to be teaching. So it's a very very complex and thorny issue when we're sort of talking about what is the teaching, what is the translation, what is actually going on, what are the teachers having to do because they feel they've got to fulfil the demand uh, demands of what the government is saying. Well, I think <laughs> now would be a really good time to ask everybody to say who they are. Um, my name is Shokri Gazar. I'm uh, from Tunisia, and I've been here for. A decade, I think. Um, I've been teaching English as a foreign language for 16 years now. But I started back home and then I uh, went to the Middle East and then I came to England. And I've been teaching English to teaching ESOL and EFL. So I work with different, with different groups of people from different countries. And I find this very interesting because um, obviously if you are teaching a group of um, people who speak the same language and you speak the same language as them, there is always the temptation to translate, but you're afraid from doing that if you're teaching a group of people who come from different countries because it would be unfair. So that's what I do. And um, I'm, I'm an MA student here, so I'm doing translation. So I find this very interesting. Who's next?
PhD student in the Chinese Studies Department. And I worked as a lecturer in South Korea for other, I mean, um, undergraduate. And most of the, my experience come from um, teaching linguistics and like, you know, like languages, English languages to undergraduate level students. And recently in South Korea, teaching in L1 is very popular rather than teaching in L2. Teaching in Korea? Yes. Even though we teach English, we always use Korean. Always. Any reason? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know whether there is like really um reason for it, but now recently one really good school in South Korea changed <coughs> their teaching system into um, teaching in L2 language in all of the classes, like in every department, like science and all the kinds of medical schools and so on. And that school is very good, I mean, very, I think, the first or second top rank in, in, the, in the South Korea. But suddenly, a lot of stu students, over like 10 a year, suicided because they couldn't understand L2 the ultimate English. test of a teaching <laughs> So now the government is very afraid of teaching in L2, you know. So now we are just transferring to teaching in L1 only right now. So you could mix, you know. Yeah, I mean <laughs> in turn, I mean if, if the department is for like lang English language department or like language department, then teaching in L2 would not be very different and difficult issue. But if the department is for like science and medical and all the kind of different subjects, then students can't understand L2 language. I mean even though if You mean English. Yeah. Right. Even though in secondary level they learn English over then like ten years, but they can't understand. Really? Oh, really? So in South Korea, all the like teaching system is like only in L1 rather than in L2. So a lot of things are, I mean, a lot of research has been focused on only L1 teaching. Okay. So I find it very interesting. The situation seems to be much different. <laughs> I'd like to come back to to Clil, to, to using English for uh, non language based teaching. Let's go through the introductions mm -hmm. first. And you've taught, right? Yeah. I used to be a teacher, uh, starting teaching, start teaching uh, two years ago, just students, uh, intermediate students and secondary students. Uh, commonly, teachers in Saudi teach, uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, to assist students, do they acquire an English name in the classes or not? Uh, it, uh, it means that if, this, if the teacher only uses translate it back into L1 
and this was a successful strategy with the one student because with, they were always complaining about uh, the right equivalence and why this word is not correct and why uh, not this uh, equivalence. So this solved the problem for them. Sure. Hi, I'm Marilyn. Uh, I'm French and I've been teaching French and Spanish for eight years in secondary schools. And I'm currently teaching French and Spanish now in primary schools and we've been doing it for eight years now. And the way it works in East London, North London, we have a two-week timetable, which means that as a native speaker, we go into the classrooms, teach a 45-minute session, and we expect the class teachers to be with us so that they can repeat the lesson or do a sort of follow-on session. So you're teaching the teachers? Or? We are teaching the class to help the teachers to teach their class. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of coaching them and, and giving them some, you know, some support with the language and with it, how to teach uh, French or Spanish. And we don't use English at all. I know my Spanish colleagues and myself, we never use French, uh, English in, class, in the classrooms. But we do know that the class teachers will be using English when we're not there. <laughs> so when we come back, we know the children are ready, they understand, they have been taught with English, which, which is fine, if, if that helps the class teachers to, uh, to be confident and able to teach French or Spanish, but we never ever use English in our lessons at all. Is this system working? It is working. So, I mean, it sounded like a war zone out there in primary schools. It's I think it depends what? where you are. And I would say that probably 60% of the children we teach all speak a second language at home, and it's, it makes a huge difference in North London. Good or bad difference? Come, no, it's a very good thing at all, because they, they don't have any issues with understanding how a language works, the accent, the pronunciation, the whole, it's, they don't ask any questions, unlike the teachers, <laughs> <laughs> who, are, who are actually scared more than the mm -hmm. children to speak a language. I can see some of my colleagues who really are struggling and saying, the kids know better than we do, and I said, no, they don't know any better than you do, they're just, they're just more confident and less worried and less, you know, panicking and less, you know, they just jump and, and but those children try are and swim and more open to languages. To languages, yes, that's true. That is so true. Yes. Would you be in favour or against the use of translation at that level? I will be in favour when we reach the fourth year of Spanish or French, because um, unlike one of one of one of you was saying, um, in primary school we do actually do some quite consistent work with the children. It's not just singing and dancing. And <laughs> so I I I I I I it's, it's not always you know jumping, no. singing, dancing. And we we manage in year six to make them um, express their opinion. Um, explain why, uh, use, you know, um, sentences which, which are structured, you know, being able to use the present tense and the past tense, strangely enough, you know, some people would say, well, you probably only use the present tense in, in French or Spanish, and we no, we don't have to use But I don't, I don't believe that we learn a language in the present tense only, <laughs> right? Just don't know for me. <laughs> Just, so they need to be able to say, I forgot my, my book, or I, you know, uh, I left it at home, don't just say that in the present tense. So there are things we don't emphasize on it, but we, we make sure they actually know that they are using the past tense and they can say it in, in the target language. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Sharon Wood. I'm a professor of Italian here um, in the School of Modern Languages in Leicester. And I do teach translation at, uh, for my final year students. I've also taught translation into Italian um, at second year level different set of circumstances. But several <coughs> years ago in another lifetime I, I, I was involved with IH as well, mm -hmm. teaching TEFL, which is where I learned how to teach all my ideas really start there with, 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 with the TEFL training. Ended up in San Sebastian, but not, not at the same time as my colleague here. Um, so I had that experience in Spain. Um, and uh, now on, on, on the side in, uh, I also translate professionally. So I'd bring that hopefully to... to, to so, so the TEFL training would be exclusion of L1, therefore exclusion <coughs> of translation? No translation in it. And I, now I, you've seen the light, or...? Uh, I think I also the light, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a long time ago now. Sorry. But no, I think where, where it helps me with the translations, so the translation is one thing, but it's also 
how you manage a translation class. And I think some of the some of the skills and strategies from TEFL have sort of carried into that. So it's not just you know sitting there word for word, you know, line for line or whatever. Um, so those things. So is translation then more useful at a very advanced level as a complex language activity? I'm not, I'm not really in a position to say whether it's more useful, it's, it's what I do. Okay. Um, and, and I've done it at different levels, um, but in, in, in the university setting. Sorry, I got up here. No, that's absolutely. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> I'm, I don't know where to go so much in the middle of the room. I'm Sarah Bruff and I work for Durham Local Authority and I'm an advisory teacher and that means that I do some intervention work with students who are struggling on the borderline between D and C at GCSE, that's a big chunk of my work, but I also do teacher induction, uh, NQT training and a lot of work in schools advising on strategies and helping schools to trial new things, particularly for active engagement. Hi, I'm uh, Akiko. Um, I come from Japan originally, but I've been living in this country for 20 years now. I'm a PhD student here in Leicester in translation studies, and I also teach translation, MA translation studies here. So I'm interested in this topic uh, from translation studies point of view. And actually, my first job after finishing college in Japan was teaching Japanese as a foreign language for a short time. So, uh, so that's my uh, language teaching uh, experience. In Japan, do you use L one in the L two classroom? To teach English yes. in schools. Yes. In L one, dominantly L one yeah. traditionally, but okay. last twenty years the government is trying to push a direct method, and then a group of linguists, group of academics are trying to fight back. So it's quite, uh, quite a big issue now in the last 20 years. Hello, my name is Paula Lewis. I've been teaching French and German for the last 20 years in primary and secondary, uh, mainly in the North Midlands. I uh, currently work in Bakewell in Derbyshire at Lady Mother's School, where I'm teaching from Key Stage 3 to Key Stage 5. Regina Hall, I'm a um, been head of languages, head of German, I've taught French and German to A level for an awful lot of years and um, I'm still actually, even though I've now actually left school as such, I'm still teaching former pupils anyway at home um, so I'm still very much involved with language teaching as indeed uh, I am via the Association of Language Learning as well. But my real belief is that a language is a skill that you have to develop and you've got to embrace it um, and translation is one of the ways that you learn that language um, from my point of view um, but when you go into a languages classroom it's different it's different from all other classrooms and you go in there and you enter another world to my mind and that's the language of that's it's the, the world of the language that you're going to be learning in that room and I just think that's just so important. And, and like I said before, I think that the translation is something which comes from your knowledge of the language, and the, the translation actually focuses you. Yeah. But it's only one of many skills. Last but not least, <laughs> um, I'm Jeff Bramall. Um, I'm chair of AWL's uh, National German Committee. Uh, I taught German and French in secondary schools for 27 years. Um, I'm, now a, I'm now retired from teaching, but I'm still involved as a freelance educational consultant. Um, one of the strings to that bow is being principal examiner for GCSE reading with AQA. Um, and I, I We'll put this in as well. That sounds like I'm bragging, but I don't like doing it. I recently completed a PhD at Manchester University um, on pupils' reading strategies in GCSE journal.